Hello, I'm V.B. Price. I'm the editor of NewMexicoMercury.com. I'm here today on Insight New Mexico with City Councilor Ray Garduño from District 6, which covers the University, Knob Hill, and the International District, sometimes known as the War Zone. Ray is an outspoken critic uh, and observer of the current police situation in Albuquerque and was instrumental in getting the DOJ to investigate the APD. The latest police killing of 19-year-old Mary Hawks took place in his district, which he has described as already having a distrust of police. It's an honor to have you here with us today in the Mercury Library, Ray. Oh, thank you, Mr. Price. VB, I've known you for a long time. Yeah. Uh, I'm just so happy that you're doing this. I think it's a great service. Uh, we know that a lot of times we don't get the... Uh, total truth. We get sometimes half truth. So I appreciate the fact that you asked me here. I'm honored. Uh, and to your question uh, about uh, Ms. Hawks, it was a tragedy. Uh, not just the loss of life, but a tragedy because I think it could have been averted. I think that um, if we had a better system of interacting with the community, that we could solve a lot of these problems that we're having and have had for a number of years now. Uh, I'm glad that you mentioned about uh, the DOJ. That was not an overnight thought. Mm. It's been something that's been asked for. Certainly, I, I uh, had a resolution that was passed by the council, five to four. It went up to the mayor, and it was vetoed. And it was vetoed, I think, on a very flimsy reason. It was something to do with the fact that we had not uh, advertised it so people were uh, aware of the fact that that resolution was coming uh, or was going to be passed. I think it was a situation where we should have at least told the DOJ, look, we're having a problem. We know that there are some things that we'd like to have uh, corrected and we'd like to have help from people who have had experience with these things. How can you help us? But instead, we obfuscated it and we made it seem as though that's not what we wanted. What we wanted just to take care of it ourselves. Well, we hadn't done it for four and a half years specifically, but for a long period of time more generally. And with that, it felt like it was time to get fresh eyes, good thinking behind what was going on. That was the whole impetus for that resolution. So the, the, uh, the recent killing of a young woman barely just at the end of her teens um, we keep on reading and waiting for information now it's been almost four days uh, we know next to nothing about it do you do you believe that the uh, the police are stonewalling us on this why why no video cams what about the video cams and the rest of the officers uh, what do you think the real story is here well you know it's, it's unconscionable to think that uh, even after all this information that we've received and all the discussion that we've had around the whole fact of getting good information about uh, what's happening out there, that we would have a situation where, as you said, this young woman who was in her late teens, uh, barely experiencing life, uh, and, and I don't pretend to know what her life was like or not like, but the point is that she was 17 years old. And the fact that we don't have clear, good information about what occurred is enough for me to ask, what are we doing? Why haven't we just had it as a, as a matter of fact, a pro forma way of acting out there with the community when, we're, when we, as a city, as a government, as a police department, why aren't we out there making sure that we know everything about these folks that we are trying to apprehend. I make no excuses for people who are really involved in crime and crime that might be dangerous to everyone. Sure. But I think that if we had uh, lapel cameras uh, and, the, and the footage from that, that we would be able to decide what has happened. And for there not to be any information coming forward because of whatever the reason is, I don't know the entire reason, but it sounds like 
the camera was simply not turned on. That's unconscionable. I mean, that, how can we say that uh, today uh, everybody knows how to turn on a camera? <laughs> Uh, and, and need be, uh, turn the camera on when you report to work and leave it running for the entire day if that's what you need and if you have a propensity for forgetting to turn it on. But at the least, you know when you're going to have an interaction with a citizen. If that's the case, then you should know to turn on the camera and it's not just for the protection of the person that you're going to apprehend if that's the case or going to interact with. It's a protection of the police officer also. Sure. That police officer needs to be able to show people that it was a dangerous situation and it was a, you know, a moment's uh, warning for me to make a decision, but it's all here on tape and everybody can objectively see what happened rather than the cloud that we're under in this uh, situation with Ms. Hawks where it sounds like it was so quickly unraveling and, on, and ongoing that there was no time for uh, the camera to be turned on. I just can't imagine how that can be sellable. And we know, unfortunately, that with another case, uh, Mr. James Boyd, that uh, cameras did show us what happened, and it was not a good thing that mm -hmm. occurred. Uh, Mary Hawks was 19, and, and uh, they apparently were chasing her for three hours. I mean... How can you not turn on your you know, lapel camera? What I'm really interested in, too, is, is what this does to the international zone, to the residents of the international zone, already a place that's, that's under a lot of pressure. Does this kind of thing, um, I, mean, is it, I mean, it must be heart-wrenching for the community. Uh, and you must be getting a lot of calls and a lot of worries from a lot of folks. Uh, could you talk a little bit about that for us? And, and thank you. You're right about uh, Ms. Hawks was 19 years old. And uh, the point is that the police officers, because really it, it falls on everyone that was there and that responded. Well, everyone yeah. should have had their cameras rolling. So, you know, if there was a mistake or a situation where one officer forgot to turn on their camera, there should have been some other folks doing the same. Uh, and... and we should have some information. I mean, it's just uh, unreal that we don't. But, you know, when you ask about <clears throat> the international district, uh, we've worked very hard to make it a place where people feel really proud of being part of that, being uh, known to live in that area where, you're right, there used to have a, a terrible name that I've vowed never to, to uh, say. Uh, but really, uh, the, the whole point is that the people had, have grown to feel confident, to feel uh, like they are being paid attention to. They are part of a social movement, if you will, yeah. where they themselves are determining how and what people think about them. So that, that I'm sure, has had uh, the situation with the shooting in the International District, I'm sure has had a dampening effect. I hate to think that it would be long-lasting. I don't think it will be. I think the people have become resilient to some of the problems uh, that existed and sometimes rear up again. But um, for my part, I will continue to uh, implore, to ask people to remember why we're doing all this. It's not just for the moment. It's not just for uh, a fleeting time. But this is forever. This, you know, we need to take back uh, that part of the of the city, and, and we have, and uh, I venture to say that we're not going to relinquish ownership of that part of the community, because it's so important, and there are so many people there who have worked, not only diligently, but just uh, day in and day out to make sure that we don't forget. They are there. We need to reconcile the fact that they are really important, strong-willed, amazing folks who have come to their own and I think will continue to. And if you go to the International District, I'd love to take people on the tour if they like. Uh, there are many things that are happening there that are just amazing. The International Festival will be happening at the Veterans Memorial uh, September 19th, I believe. Uh, 
But that's just to prove yeah. that the community has rallied, uh, knows that things happen because the community makes them happen, not because any individual, whoever that is, and I would never claim myself uh, to be the person, but I certainly have worked hard, and so has uh, Senator Tim Keller, uh, many other folks that have that are there as elected officials, Maggie Hart Stebbins, uh, Cheryl Stapleton, many people have worked very hard, but it's the individuals within the community that make it happen. Sure. And they're the ones that essentially tell us what they want, because that's what the community does. And elected officials uh, are best served if they listen rather than talk. So speaking of listening, uh, the city council had has had an opportunity now to listen, I believe, twice to a, an impassioned citizenry uh, about the current behavior at the APD, which has now resulted in 24 police killings, 28 shootings in a period of just a little bit over four years. Um, what was your impression of those meetings? What was your impression of your fellow counselors? What did you get out of hearing the public? Uh, B.B., thank you for asking that. I think it's really important for people to realize that folks who came to us for those two meetings was cathartic, was important. But, you know, they had been coming to us for many years. And I had listened to them. I uh, empathized with a lot of things that they were saying. I would never pretend to know what it's like to lose a child. I have a son who's um, 35 years old. Uh, I can only imagine what that would be like. I know, I know. I can only imagine. So, so it was um, on my part to show folks that I was listening, that I was hoping that we would come to some level of understanding of what uh, these families were telling us. Now, the last two meetings uh, of the city council, and I want to tell you that um, I spoke to uh, Ken Sanchez, who's president, and uh, over coffee and uh, some burritos at Max on uh, West Central, uh, we talked about what do we need to do? And I told them, look, the community needs to be heard. The two-minute time limits that we've been giving them for the last three and a half years, certainly, last two years specifically, is not enough. I mean, if anything, I would, as a community member, feel somewhat slighted and maybe even disrespected if I'm not listened to at a longer period than that. So I asked if uh, it would be all right if we had some representatives uh, from the community come and speak to us with a longer period of time. And, uh, and he said, fine, what do you think we need to do? And we talked about it. And uh, inevitably what happened was that the agenda was cleared of all business, if you will, except two items that needed to be uh, dealt with that night. But the rest of the time was reserved completely for community response and community uh, discussion. And we had four people, very important people in the community, uh, who they themselves, I'm sure, would tell you they represent areas of interest, areas of importance. Um, and we had uh, uh, Nicole Moreland, who spoke from the level of what families have experienced and what disaster it has caused within that family structure by losing a loved one. We had uh, Ralph Arianes, who is a community member, an activist uh, on the executive, uh, I believe he's executive director or executive uh, president of LULAC statewide, also with a Hispanic Roundtable. He um, spoke to us from that viewpoint and what the city council could do. We had uh, uh, Jose Martinez, who was homeless at one point and had worked himself out of that. And he himself uh, has said that he had some addictions that he had to work out. Uh, and he's talked to us about the homelessness and how sometimes the homeless are mistreated, misunderstood, and how important it would be for us, the council, to start looking at those situations very specifically. And then we had uh, 
Miss uh, uh, Vargas, uh, and she spoke from the viewpoint of of having to deal with and having to struggle with mental illness. And one of the things she did, if anybody saw that uh, piece of, of uh, tape, uh, she put on the table the number of medications that she has to take to keep uh, just, you know, a sense about herself. She was amazingly poignant in describing why it's so important to make sure that people with mental illness are treated differently. You cannot just rush up to someone and pretend like they're going to be acting as if they understand what you're saying, especially when they're being, if you will, bombarded by all these uh, commands and and uh, probably in some ways very scary. Yeah. And uh, if you're suffering through mental illness and maybe are having an episode that is unwielding, uh, that you might react in a way that some people might think is um, something you should, you know, uh, as a police officer, react to it with, with violence. And that's just not the way to do it. So, you know, any of us who have children and grandchildren, our grandchildren are 18 and 16 now, and our children are 50s, you know, the mere thought of losing a family member or losing a child is so horrible. Mm. Uh, I, but to get back to the council, if I might, <clears throat> um, I've been w watching the city council uh, since it was morphed from the commission in '74, in, right. in and uh, I've seen a lot of really feisty councils, a lot of angry councils, a lot of councils who went went uh, knuckle to knuckle with the mayor. Uh, and I'm wondering, uh, what's happened to this council? Why? I mean. Uh, uh, yourself excluded. What, what the heck is going on with these people? I mean, they don't. I mean, I know that you need a supermajority to do certain things. I'm not even totally clear what that actually means anymore. But I keep on wondering in the back of my mind if they're intimidated by the police. Well, I'm glad you asked that question because I think the public is asking that question themselves, and I know that it's been written about and discussed in many forums in many ways. Uh, so I'll give an attempt <laughs> at what I think is happening. And um, I think you're right. I think that there's been a level of, if not complacency, a level of, well, things will work out. Uh, we don't have to worry because uh, the police will, you know, get back to policing. And I don't think that's going to happen. And we know that for, again, for two and a half years, this has happened. And I could excuse people not being uh, ready to act were it six months into it. Yeah. But after two and a half years, we need to do something. Yeah. Uh, Councillor Winter and myself introduced uh, a task force and, and asked right. that a task force be put together to look at the Police Oversight Commission. It was a dysfunctional commission. We knew that. And a lot of people had told us. So right now we're going through a process of getting an ordinance that will give the Police Oversight Commission uh, the teeth, if you will, to make some changes. Uh, regrettably, one of the things that happens is length of time to do a lot of these things. Meanwhile, the community thinks that uh, we're not doing anything, and that's not quite true. But I absolutely agree that uh, I wish things could have happened faster, and uh, we have that ordinance to be heard next council meeting, May 5th. Uh, we hope to go further than that by even incorporating in some ways, and if not within the POC, because that's not, not their uh, purview, but some other way of making sure that the recommendations that the Department of Justice has come forward with in their report, that they are upheld, if that's the term, mm -hmm. that they are uh, part of the consent decree. And the consent decree essentially says that uh, these are things that we observed as a uh, Department of Justice. These are things that we recommend, that we say you do to correct those. Uh, there's a tendency on the part of every bureaucracy, uh, especially when they're found to have to be lacking, uh, 
to try and recoil and try and uh, diminish what has been said about them. And I think that's part of what's going on now. And I don't particularly appreciate the fact that we are paying folks to come in to negotiate. And I think that's the term that keeps getting used. Uh, there's nothing to negotiate. I agree. Uh, you know, if, I agree. if I'm being told that I'm acting in an irrational way, and these are ways that I can correct that irrationality, then I should pay attention to that, not try and see how I can, you know, banter and, and, <laughs> and diminish or uh, soften the findings, because that's not either in the purview of, of uh, the city to do, and it's certainly not the way you're going to fix things. If they want the police to have certain kinds of training, we should look at that. There are best practices all over. Yes. And we know that they work. Yes. Why are we fighting it? That's yeah. just unconscionable. Again, as I say, you can't correct mistakes or even bad behavior if you keep doing it over and over again. It's just not a way to do things. And um, I would hope that we would come to our senses in, in a bipartisan, in a way that we're thinking that the city is much more important than any one of us, doesn't matter who it is, from the mayor to the councillors to anybody. And I think part of the problem has been that, is that there's been this loggerheads of, of uh, who should have the last word, and I don't think anybody should have the last word. I think the community should tell us how to act and what they need, and we should just listen to them. But I want to be very sure to answer as specifically as I can about where this council has been. It's been AWOL. It's been on some level uh, not ready to, to face some of these problems. And we had a lot of split votes, you know, 5-4. And uh, was it partisan? That's the way it looked yeah. because that's the, the way that the numbers came out. Yeah. Um, but I would hope that we're bigger than that. Yeah. You know, I would hope that going forward that there's no more 5-4. <laughs> that we have, uh, you alluded to the fact of a supermajority. I would like for us to be 9-0 yeah. on some of these issues yeah. because they are just that important. And I just can't imagine anyone not being able to see past the fact that there are needed decisions to be made. So when, you, when one reads the Justice Department letter, all 46 pages of it, probably the most startling uh, detailed document of its kind. I've, I've certainly never read anywhere, although I'm sure it's, it's, it's like it is in Chicago and Seattle and other places that have had these kinds of problems. One of the little sentences that are sort of thrown away is that basically if you don't do this stuff, you nice people, we're going to take you to trial. We're going to sue you in civil court. Uh, I'd like you to reflect on what the implications of that might be and what the outcomes of such a thing might be and what role the council would play in in how that evolves. Maybe uh, I would hope that we don't get into this, back again to this bantering about who should and who shouldn't, but rather that we embrace what we've been told and uh, go to task and make sure that the things that we can do, we will do, and the things that we need to learn to do, that we learn them. And I tell you, uh, there's nothing worse than a petulant child who thinks they're right and then is shown to be wrong and still doesn't want to do what they're supposed to. So uh, I hope we're not that. <laughs> I hope we're grown-ups. And uh, whatever things we've done that aren't correct, aren't uh, to the betterment of this city, that we correct them. That's why we were elected. Yeah. We weren't elected to pontificate or to make sure that one of us is better than the other because we're not. And my father used to always say, you know, all of us are a lot smarter and a lot better than any one of us. And you know, you can take the percentages any way you want, but the percentage is still 100%. And wherever we fit in that, we need to be sure to uphold our part of that. Uh, now, the other part of, of uh, what you've asked, I think, is, is important. Uh, and let me just ask you specifically. When you say that 
the sentence that's thrown out is, we'll take you to court. <laughs> They mean it. <laughs> you know, the Department of Justice, uh, for whatever we think individually about the Department of Justice or whatever we think about government in general, federal government specifically, or any of those things, it doesn't matter. If they say that you don't comply, you don't do the things that you have been asked to do, we'll take you to court. The ramifications of that is disastrous. It is not something we want to be at. <laughs> we want to be in a place where when they say, these are the things you need to do, we'll do them, and they come back and say, great. And we say, you know what? We have done the things we needed to do, and we're better for it. And in fact, we have a functioning city in many levels, or maybe all levels, and we don't need to worry about that. If we go to court, it'll just be one accusation after another and one uh, fight, if you will, that is not good for us just as a city, but for those fiscal conservative types, <laughs> I want to tell them that if that were to happen, this city will be on the hook for upwards of $20 million. And that's what's happened in other jurisdictions, especially jurisdictions that have resisted and have tried to fight the obvious uh, things that they needed to do. And what's happened is that um, we needed to pay a monitor, we needed to pay, all, you know, we'll need to do a lot of things that'll just be costly, just off the top. Never mind the fiber of the community and how that's going to also unravel. Although I always cringe when people put the monetary value on these deaths. Right. Uh, still, we've already forked out 20, 30, 40 million bucks, uh, uh, and we go to, go to court, that's going to be a lot worse. But that's, I've always been uh, surprised at the, um, at the charter in its, um, uh, in its unspoken view about the relationship between the mayor and the police chief. I know that uh, that it's always been this way. The, uh, the mayor, and even in the old days, in, in the city commission, uh, the city manager oftentimes, uh, de facto, appointed the police chief. Okay. Um, what? Uh, so, uh, you've written some legislation, and, and some other legislation has been written about trying trying to bring that under control. Obviously, this is this is not working right. in any remote sense of the word. Uh, so. Could you explain the various bills in the council at the moment? You know, you're right. Uh, the operation sounds like it's a sound idea, but it isn't. Because you have allegiance to a boss, if you will, yeah. as opposed to allegiance to the community. Yeah. Public safety officers, especially the chief of that whole department, needs to be able to make decisions and recommendations and, in fact, run a department that is one of the most important departments in the whole city in a way that is unencumbered. Yes. Because I think once you, or as we have, once you have someone uh, answering to an individual, like the mayor in this case, uh, or the CAO, that you start seeing how that person's going to react how that person's going to answer a question, or in fact, how in some cases they'll rescind what they've done because they want to be in step with their bosses. And that's just not right. So to go to the legislation, let me just begin, I think, with what is a little softer, uh, and that's uh, Councillor Winter and Councillor Sanchez have introduced a an ordinance that will ask the mayor to bring the candidate in front of the council for advice and consent. And the advice and consent is wonderful. I think uh, the council can then uh, have an opportunity to question, to make sure that that person, in fact, understands the needs of the community. But I felt like we needed more than that. I felt like we needed let's say complete independence, if you will. Mm -hmm. And I've proposed uh, an ordinance that will ask that the police chief be in elected position. Like the sheriff. Like the sheriff. And if um, people can't 
play good in the positions they're in, then let's have the public weigh in. Mm -hmm. Some people have said, well, you know, then that means they get elected for four years and what are you going to do? Cool. Recall them and throw them out. Yeah. But if nothing else, you have the opportunity to choose folks who have, in fact, told the community, this is how I'm going to do things, this is what I think is important, and you be the judge and you vote me in or vote me out. That's how we should do that. And I think that's the greatest level of independence that we can show. Now, some people said, well, what makes you think that another politician, you know, is a good thing? Well, I would hope that we wouldn't get another politician. <laughs> I would hope that we would get somebody who is a professional that knows what they're doing and is willing to listen to the community and knows that if he doesn't, he will have to pay. Uh, so I'm not asking for someone to uh, elect anybody. I think that probably would be one of the more important choices that people would have to make, uh, especially with a history that we've had. We need to have someone who the community says, now there's someone that I trust, that I have had the opportunity to vet on myself and be able to then feel like if the day that that person doesn't act the way they're supposed to or certainly the way they said they were going to, that I have the opportunity to meet with that person and remind them of that. And if not, then we recall them or we vote them out. But um, that is, I think some people think, a, a radical concept. I think it happens in a lot of jurisdictions, and it happens certainly, as, as you mentioned, uh, with a sheriff here in uh, the county. You remark about, about everybody worrying about you know, electing <laughs> another politician. I mean, there, there is such a thing as a job description and right. criteria for, for such a job. So... Um, I wanted to ask you a little bit about um, uh, what do you think in the long run? What kind of what kind of mechanism and what kind of independence does a really effective police oversight commission have to have? And is it this is an awfully hard question to ask, but is it possible in this kind of climate, this kind of divisiveness and this kind of this cloud, this terrible dark cloud that's over us all? Is it possible to get something that would work right now? Or do we really have to just clean house and start over? Well, B.B., if you're asking about whether the Police Oversight Commission, as constituted right now, is something that we should move forward, absolutely not. And in fact, the ordinance that uh, Councillor Winter and myself have introduced, and in fact is through the process right now, okay. is a draft form. Mm -hmm. But it, it speaks to the fact that we had a dysfunctional police oversight commission, and it was made even more so by some contorted legal uh, opinions on the part of the city attorney. Mm. Uh, whether maliciously or not, I would never say that because I don't know. Uh, but it just rendered the police oversight commission absolutely uh, neutered it, you know, eviscerated it. So we can't go that way. We need to have an ordinance that makes sure that and it's going to be called the police uh, oversight agency and the agency then means that they'll have their own budget mm -hmm. which is very important mm -hmm. they'll have subpoena power which is very important mm -hmm. they'll have their own legal advice because they'll be able to hire not the city attorney advice but independent uh, legal advice they also will be able to look at any of the material that has been presented and they will have, essentially, uh, the ability to direct the independent review officer as to how the reports will be presented to them. They will also be able to recommend uh, what kinds of punishment, if you will, from a matrix, or I don't know how that will work, but um, from a, a level of how and where police officers should be uh told that their, their uh, whatever the behavior was will now be corrected by these uh, recommendations. They'll still go to the chief, and hopefully it'll be a chief that was elected. <laughs> and, uh, and then if the chief says, no, I'm not going to use that as a criterion for punishment, 
then the, he has to have a written reason why he's not following the direction of the police oversight agency. Those are things that we felt we needed to change, but they didn't come from as manna. Yeah. It came from very deliberate, very important discussions on the part of a police oversight task force that, again, Councilor Winter and myself asked to be put together. The council agreed, and we have had the recommendations come back to us. Those recommendations have been put into this ordinance. And we felt it was very important to not have a rubber stamp or a, another study or another task force report that would just be you know, put on some shelf somewhere, but rather that we would have a working document that was vetted by that task force. And it's very important. 90% of what the task force has uh, recommended will be in that ordinance. A couple of things will not, but those are things that we can, we can discuss. Publicly, one person, anyway, has accused me of, of um, I forget even the word that he used, that I, not abandoned, but I betrayed. I betrayed the community by not doing exactly as the task force asked. And it's a person who I think has had a grudge over the years because he has been put on some of the commissions and some of the task forces. And those are the kinds of things we need to avoid. Mm -hmm. uh, if somebody has a constructive way of doing things, I am more than willing to listen to it, especially now that we're going through this process. But to pot shot and to uh, try and sabotage things, it's just not uh, important. Because as I said before, all of this is much more important than any one of us. Doesn't matter who we are. Will this new uh, police oversight agency uh, have a capacity to override the veto of a chief? Uh, BB, in uh, the best of all possible worlds, they will be able to get into a discussion with the chief and ask, because of the written statement that has been uh, brought to the police oversight agency, as to why, where, when, and why not, mm -hmm. more specifically. And then there would be uh, a consensus as to how they should move forward. But it shouldn't be thought of as a way for the chief to just, you know, summarily say no and that's all. Because I think there will be a process by which the police oversight agency will then be able to weigh in on whatever decision has been made. Otherwise, I think you're right, it would be going back to uh, the chief saying whatever they want and not having any ramifications from the agency. So I'm seeing the, the, uh, this, this agency is really sort of doing away with the necessity of a grand jury to investigate um, police shootings. Uh, grand juries are, of course, prosecutorial events. There's no defendant. There's only, only prosecutors and policemen. Right. So I've always wondered how that might work, which I don't think it's worked very well, as we've right. seen. Right. Uh, but um, so um, there is a lot of political shenanigans going on in all of this, and I just have have to bring it up. Chief Eden is is the former uh, public safety secretary for the governor of New Mexico. We have a lot of, of, of roundhouse movement. We know, we know that the mayor is also of the same political party, and I know we're trying to be bipartisan and all the rest of that. Uh, but I'm, I'm, we also know now that the new man who's going to be looking at the DOJ report is the best friend of the chief. And so there's a, there seems to be, at least in, in the part of a lot of us, a kind of um, head-scratching going on about uh, uh, what's really going on here, and who's been left out, and who's inside. I absolutely agree with you. I think that, unfortunately, uh, the whole process has been tainted because of the perception. Uh, are any of those individuals good people? More than likely. I don't know. Sure. But I think that when you have a tether that it's very easy to follow, it's hard to then deny the fact that there's influence. Yeah. Uh, whether it's direct or assumed or loyalty or a lot of those things that happens, those are things that we should be beyond. Yeah. We should make sure that if we're going to 
go out and look for the best person for a position, that the best person be sought. We had a national search, and no one nationally was interviewed. Uh, they were, no. I think, phone interviews. There were, uh, nobody was brought in. Nobody was vetted or dismissed. Uh, and then I think there was, it was fairly precipitous that um, Mr. Eaton was brought in. Uh, I have nothing against Mr. Eaton. I don't know him well enough to tell you that he is or he isn't. But uh, again, the public needs to know that they're being listened to, first of all, and if they're being listened to, that the best person who would answer those questions would be in that position. And it doesn't seem that way because, as I say, those tethers are so closely entwined. Uh, and you're right, to have someone who has been in the inner sanctum of these other folks who um, may have influence over decisions and whatever else, uh, case in point, the very, f I think the third day or so, when the shooting occurred, uh, that was clearly with Boyd. by Mr. Boyd, yeah, exactly. there was clearly something that you should have waited on before you rendered a decision, that it was uh, said that it was justified. And then it was rescinded because the mayor questioned it. Yeah. Then, the you know, uh, what are we doing? You know, is this going to be best of three? Uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we need to be careful that when we are in serious situations like this, we don't have that cloud over decision making. And we don't have that influence peddling, if you will, that seems like it could go on. And uh, I don't know that that's what's happened. But certainly, when you talk to public, most of the public is wondering, why? Why are we making these decisions based on folks who have a lot to gain by making certain kinds of decisions? What do you think will stop these killings, these murders, these executions? What is it going to take to stop it? What is it going to take to stop it now? Right. VB, thank you for asking that question because that's, after all, what we're trying to accomplish, to make sure that there are no more shootings. And I'm glad you also said, is it going to stop now? That is an important, important time frame. Because if we just say, well, you know, as soon as we learn how not to, as soon as everybody's trained correctly, as soon, uh, those aren't acceptable parameters. We don't want this to go on, first of all. And if we have any inkling, any doubt that it's going to continue, do everything you have to to stop it. Bring in legions of mental health experts, if that's what's needed. Bring in folks who have dealt with these situations to do it. We're quick to outfit our SWAT teams. And we can get within hours 75 to 100 people with these uh, menacing uh, uniforms and regalia and uh, 50 caliber machine guns on top of armored personnel carriers or whatever those things are called. I, I'm, sure, I'm sure I'm using the wrong <laughs> terminology. The point being that if we can get those people out there that quickly, why can't we get folks who know how to talk to people, who know how to make sure that if somebody's having a bad episode, let's call it, a situation where they don't know what to do, that we have professionals that come in and are able to talk about it. I have talked to um, Senator Jerry Ortiz Pino, and he has said there are legions of folks who, you know, may not stop somebody's angst at the moment, but they certainly will be able to de-escalate, if you will, sure. by simply waiting out the situation. We don't need to rush in and make it sound as if if we don't take care of the situation that the world will end. After all, time is on our side. And in fact, time is the best peacemaker for anything, but especially when somebody's having that kind of a terrible situation in their lives. 
I don't want to make it to to be the city councilor on the city council when we didn't act. I don't want to be known as the person who just sat there while the families told us all the things that they have told us and we just sat there. I don't want to be the city councilor that people will say, you know, he had an opportunity to do things and he just sat there. I don't want to sit there anymore. Ray, thank you so very much for being here with us today in this really deeply troubling moment in our city's history. Probably the most horrifying and terrifying I've ever seen after 58 years here. And uh, it's an honor to talk with you. Thank you, BB. Thank you so it's much. an honor to be here. I've always uh, felt like you uh, had the sense of what's going on out there, both on an artistic level and on a heartfelt community level. And whenever I've been to situations where you're there, um, I feel proud to be there also because we've talked about many important things, whether it be the conservation of water, uh, the situation we're facing right now, uh, anything like that, I know that you'll be there to make sure that people understand it.